Moby Dick, by Herman Melville. Chapter 54. The Town Hose Story. As told at the Golden Inn, the Cape of Good Hope, and all the watery region round about there, is much like some noted four corners of a great highway, where you meet more travelers than in any other part. It was not very long after speaking the Gone that another homeward bound whale man, the town ho, asterisk was encountered. She was manned almost wholly by Polynesians. In the short game that ensued she gave us strong news of Moby Dick. To some the general interest in the white whale was now wildly heightened by a circumstance of the town ho's story, which seemed obscurely to involve with the whale a certain wondrous, inverted visitation of one of those so-called judgments of God which at times are said to overtake some men. This latter circumstance, with its own particular accompaniments, forming what may be called the secret part of the tragedy about to be narrated, never reached the ears of Captain Nahab or his mates, for that secret part of the story was unknown to the captain of the town hall himself. It was the private property of three Confederate white seamen of that ship, one of whom, it seems, communicated it to Tashtago with Ramish injunctions of secrecy, but the following night Tashtago rambled in his sleep, and revealed so much of it in that way, that when he was wakened he could not well withhold the rest. Nevertheless, so potent an influence did this thing have on those seamen in the Pequod who came to the full knowledge of it, and by such a strange delicacy, to call it so, were they governed in this matter that they kept the secret among themselves so that it never transpired abaft the Pequod's main mast, interweaving in its proper place this arcer thread with the story as publicly narrated on the ship, the whole of this strange affair I now proceed to put on lasting record. The ancient whale cry upon first sighting a whale from the masthead, still used by whalemen in hunting the famous Galapagos terrapin. For my humor's sake, I shall preserve the style in which I once narrated it at Lima, to a lounging circle of my Spanish friends, one Saint's Eve, smoking upon the thick GILT tiled piazza of the Golden Inn, of those fine cavaliers, the young Dons, Pedro and Sebastian, were on the closer terms with me, and hence the interluding questions they occasionally put, and which are duly answered at the time. Some two years prior to my first learning the events which I am about rehearsing to you, gentlemen, the town ho, sperm whaler of Nantucket, was cruising in your Pacific here, not very many days sail eastward from the eaves of this good golden inn. She was somewhere to the northward of the line. One morning upon handling the pumps, according to daily usage, it was observed that she made more water in her hold than common. They supposed a swordfish had stabbed her, gentlemen. But the captain, having some unusual reason for believing that rare good luck awaited him in those latitudes, and therefore being very averse to quit them, and the league not being then considered at all dangerous, though, indeed, they could not find it after searching the hold as low down as was possible in rather heavy weather, the ship still continued her cruisings, the mariners working at the pumps at wide and easy intervals, but no good luck came, more days went by, and not only was the leak yet undiscovered, but it sensibly increased, so much so, that now taking some alarm, the captain, making all sail, stood away for the nearest harbor among the islands, there to have his aha uh -huh out and repaired. Though no small passage was before her, yet, if the commonest chance favored, he did not at all fear that his ship would founder by the way, because his pumps were of the best, and being periodically relieved at them, those six and thirty men of his could easily keep the ship free, never mind if the leak should double on her. In truth, well nigh the whole of this passage being attended by very prosperous breezes, the town ho had all but certainly arrived in perfect safety at her port without the occurrence of the least fatality, had it not been for the brutal overbearing of Radney, the mate, a vineyarder, and the bitterly provoked vengeance of Steel Kilt, a lakeman and desperado from Buffalo. Lakeman. Buffalo. Pray, what is a lakeman, and where is Buffalo? said Don Sebastian, rising in his swinging mat of grass. 
on the eastern shore of our Lake Erie, Don, but, I crave your courtesy, maybe, you shall soon hear further of all that. Now, gentlemen, in square sail brigs and three-masted ships, well nigh as large and stout as any that ever sailed out of your old Kailau to far Manila, this lakeman, in the landlocked heart of our America, had yet been nurtured by all those agrarian freebooting impressions popularly connected with the open ocean. For in their interflowing aggregate, those grand fresh water seas of ours, Erie, and Ontario, and Huron, and Superior, and Michigan, possess an ocean-like expansiveness, with many of the ocean's noblest traits, with many of its rim varieties of races and of climes. They contain round archipelagos of romantic isles, even as the Polynesian waters do, in large part, are shored by two great contrasting nations, as the Atlantic is. They furnish long maritime approaches to our numerous territorial colonies from the east, dotted all round their banks, here and there are frowned upon by batteries and by the goat-like craggy guns of lofty Makina, they have heard the fleet thunderings of naval victories. At intervals, they yield their beaches to wild barbarians, whose red-painted faces flash from out their peltry wigwams, for leagues and leagues are flanked by ancient and unentered forests, where the gaunt pines stand like serried lines of kings and gothic genealogies, those same woods harboring wild Afric beasts of prey and silken creatures whose exported furs give robes to Tartar emperors. They mirror the paved capitals of Buffalo and Cleveland, as well as Winnebago villages. They float alike the full-rigged merchant ship, the armed cruiser of the state, the steamer, and the beach canoe. They are swept by boron and dismast and blast as direful as any that lash the salted wave. They know what shipwrecks are, for out of sight of land, however inland, they have drowned full many a midnight ship with all its shrieking crew. Thus, gentlemen, though an inlander, steel kilt was wild ocean born, and wild ocean nurtured, as much of an audacious mariner as any. And for Radney, though in his infancy he may have laid him down on the lone Nantucket beach, to nurse at his maternal sea, though in after life he had long followed our austere Atlantic and your contemplative Pacific, Yet was he quite as vengeful and full of social quarrel as the backwoods seamen, fresh from the latitudes of buckhorn-handled bowie knives. Yet was this Nantucketer a man with some good-hearted traits, and this lakeman, a mariner, who though a sort of devil indeed, might yet by inflexible firmness, only tempered by that common decency of human recognition which is the meanest slave's right, thus treated, this steel kilt had long been retained harmless and docile. At all events, he had proved so thus far, but Radney was doomed and made mad, and still killed, but, gentlemen, you shall hear. It was not more than a day or two at the furthest after appointing her prow for her island haven, that the townhouse leak seemed again increasing, but only so as to require an hour or more at the pumps every day. You must know that in a settled and civilized ocean like our Atlantic, for example, some skippers think little of pumping their whole way across it, though of a still, sleepy night, should the officer of the deck happen to forget his duty in that respect, the probability would be that he and his shipmates would never again remember it, on account of all hands gently subsiding to the bottom, nor in the solitary and savage seas far from you to the westward, gentlemen, is it altogether unusual for ships to keep clanging at their pump handles in full course even for a voyage of considerable length. That is, if it lie along a tolerably accessible coast, or if any other reasonable retreat is afforded them. It is only when a leaky vessel is in some very out-of-the-way part of those waters, some really landless latitude, that her captain begins to feel a little anxious. Much this way had it been with the town ho, so when her leak was found gaining once more, there was in truth some small concern manifested by several of her company, especially by Radney the mate. He commanded the upper sails to be well hoisted, sheeted home anew, and every way expanded to the breeze. Now this Radney, I suppose, was as little of a coward, and as little inclined to any sort of nervous apprehensiveness touching his own person as any fearless, 
unthinking creature on land or on sea that you can conveniently imagine, gentlemen. Therefore when, 